you're buying something for 60,000 today for it to be worth a million tomorrow, meaning 10, 15 years down the line. The American dream is not available to a lot of Americans. I'm sure many people in Europe feel the same way. Many people in Australia probably feel the same way. Each person gets 300,000 Satoshis. If you have a million sats, that is over three times what the average person will be able to have. That's the equivalent of having 3x the median net worth. You're going to watch Bitcoiners get richer over time, which is then going to continue to incentivize you to move to that standard. 1 million sats is probably enough for you to retire sometime 2045. Inflation is like a compounding issue. Once it starts to get out of hand, you can't really rein it in. Why am I paying for social security if it's going to run out in 2035? We don't have enough money coming in. The United States is insolvent for a house. 1970, you needed about 14,000 minimum wage hours. Today, you're going to need 57,000. When inflation goes up, they are stealing your time. You control your impulse today in order to prosper tomorrow. Bitcoin is a brain bank. The 2025 bull run can change your life. If you look at the Bitcoin chart and then you zoom in to all the times before it blew up, it looked exactly like what it looks like right now. You are going to 10x your company by doing no extra work. Why would you not do it? I think more people are going to be adopting this strategy, individuals and corporations. Gen C uh, and Bitcoins, like you call yourself Gen C, BTC. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. First of all, like I'm still Gen C. A lot of people uh, would put me in the min millennials bracket, but I'm actually yeah. like two years too young for that <laughs> to be in the millennials bracket. So like I'm still Gen Z. Uh, and Gen Z for, for now, it's I think like 13 years or 12 years till like 27, something uh, along yes. those that bracket is Gen Z right now because I know not not everyone knows exactly where to uh, to break down those lines. So why is uh, owning like Bitcoin in general a big deal for for Gen Z? And I also saw you made a um, a video around like why owning zero point one Bitcoin is a big deal. Uh, so maybe let's uh, first like talk general about Bitcoin for Gen Z, and then maybe a little bit about the the, the amount of zero point one Bitcoin. Yeah. So first, thank you so much for watching my videos. That's amazing. Uh, and the reason why Gen Z, in my opinion, has to focus on to Bitcoin is uh, for a couple of reasons. But the first one is they have the most uncertain future of any generation prior. Right. The further you go back in history, the more certain the future looked for people. Right. So people maybe in the you know 1920s, the roaring 20s, you know, you go to school, you get your job at the factory. And you're able to take care of your family, right? Just one guy working can take care of his wife, his two or three kids and his dog. Uh, you know what I mean? They got a, they have a, uh, everything that they need. All right. There's not a lot of worry in terms of economy at that time. You go a little bit further into the future, let's say 1950s. It's the same song and dance. Things really haven't changed too much. Uh, housing is still uh, affordable. In fact, it becomes a great investment. A lot of the baby boomers who bought houses, right? They might have bought something for like 50000 uh, 60,000. And today it might be worth a million. You know what I mean? Uh, interestingly, I think that we have a unique opportunity today to do the same thing. That is buying a Bitcoin. You're buying something for 60,000 today for it to be worth a million tomorrow, tomorrow, meaning like 10, 15 years down the line, right? Uh, go a little bit further into the 1970s, right? This is when we start to get off the gold standard and now things start shifting. Okay. Um, People are still able to afford things because the rate of inflation has not impacted them yet. But this is where it starts. This is where it begins. All right. Uh, you're still in a position where you can even ask your parents. Your parents probably grew up. Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. But they were kids. You know, when they were kids, they understand that things were a lot cheaper than they are today. Right. You go a little bit further into the future. Now you're in the 1990s, early 2000s. These people, um, they have to deal with, um, you know, insane financial collapses like 2008. Uh, the cost of living is slowly creeping up. Now it starts to look like for the millennials, right? That's when they were kids. They've grown up now and now they're seeing, oh, wait a minute, this is not as easy and as simple as my family made it out to be. You know, some people are getting to that age today where they're like, I did everything I was supposed to do. You know, I went to school. I went into debt to get my degree. I played by the rules. I worked my nine to five. And now it doesn't seem like I'll be able to take those steps when it comes to uh, okay, first an apartment, then home ownership, then you get your car, then you get a nicer car, and then you take care of a family, then you have kids. It seems like a lot of these steps in life, uh, the American dream as it's sold, 
is not available to a lot of Americans. And I can't speak on the rest of the world. I'm sure many people in Europe uh, feel the same way. Uh, many people in Australia probably feel the same way. Uh, but we in America, the dream of being able to have ownership over your assets is slowly going away. That's why they talk about you'll own nothing and be happy, right? So there's even a, there's even a retirement crisis, right? Because pensions, your job's not coming to save you. Social Security's running out. That's going lower and lower. Uh, it just seems like there's no money for anyone. But somehow the 1% keep getting richer and richer. And that keeps growing while the middle class and below keep shrinking. Uh, so for that reason, I think Gen Z is very inclined to look into a system that works in their favor and not against them. Absolutely. Really cool. I, I think you laid it down, uh, laid it out really, really nicely. Also. Um, and what is now to, to protect yourself against what you just like described and going into depth for, for student loan and, and all those uh, weird things you can do uh, to make your life really, really hard uh, in, in the beginning. Um, how do you protect yourself now with Bitcoin? Is like 0.1 Bitcoin actually enough for doing that uh, and, and to, to protect yourself for, for, for the long-term future? Because it's, uh, I make some videos around like retiring on Bitcoin and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting for me because sometimes I get that <coughs> feedback of like, oh yeah, like we need, you need at least like three to five Bitcoin to retire. And I'm like, ah, I don't know if you need that much depending on how old you are and when you want to retire. But 0.1 Bitcoin still seems like a, a, a low number, uh, but it probably depends on like the, the year's outlook and, and, and when you want to retire, right? Yeah, so there are a few different tools that you can use. Um, Rajat has a look up Rajat Bitcoin. You'll find him. Uh, he was a, I believe, a former CPA and a great, great guy. A lot of great information. He has a tool that you can download on Excel in order to track how much savings you would have over time if you saved a certain amount of Bitcoin and what the compound annual growth rate would be. Michael Saylor also has a tool. It's called Bitcoin 24. You can download it on GitHub. Uh, it's another spreadsheet, Excel. You can also use that tool uh, if you have a business or if you're an individual to see exactly how much your Bitcoin will be worth uh, under the assumption that the compound growth rate is a certain percent. Now, for reference, over the last four years, the compound annual growth rate has been 55%. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I do think that number will actually go up. A lot of people say, no, it's going to go down towards 20%. I think it'll go up. Here's why. You have to think and you have to realize maybe... Two to three percent of the world currently is using Bitcoin, right? That means that you are majorly ahead of the curve. Everyone likes to say, oh, I wish I could have bought Apple before they brought, dropped the first iPhone. Uh, okay, this is your iPhone moment, all right? Why is point one so valuable? Let's break it down by the numbers. An individual, if Bitcoin were divided evenly across all people, right? Let's just do 21 million divided by 8 billion, right? You get 0 0.00265, something like that. That can be converted into about 256,000 Satoshis, right? 256, 265, something like that. Let's just call it 300,000. Each person gets 300,000 Satoshis. If you have a million sats, um, that's 0 0.01, right? 0 0.01 is over three times what the average person will be able to have. That's the equivalent of having 3x the median net worth, okay? The average net worth. Um, you'll be far beyond that, right? You'll be three times excluded from that. And that number is actually incorrect. 300,000 is incorrect. It's lower than that because of people like Michael Saylor, because of people like me, because of people like BlackRock, because I have way more than the average already and I'm not selling my BTC, because I don't want to sell my finite asset for something that is infinite. That's where the value comes from. And um, I believe it was Seyfedin Amus, the writer of the Bitcoin Standard. He talks about how ignoring someone with a harder money than you will be impossible. So what happens is you're going to watch Bitcoiners get richer over time, which is then going to continue to incentivize you to move to that standard but there will not be enough for everyone. And in order to get ahead of that mad dash for Bitcoin, where we see that gap up in price, that's extremely quick and extremely violent. Um, you would probably want to have at least the average amount before that happens. 
for that reason, that's why I'm saying that's enough for you to retire. What's the time frame? Use some of those tools. But if I had to guess, I would say 0.01, 1%, not 10%, not 10 million, 1 million sats is probably enough for you to retire sometime like 2045, uh, maybe yeah, probably 2045. It's interesting. I, I just pulled that up, but uh, so you can also see it. Uh, there is the apparently in 2022, I, I just like quickly Googled that uh, the average wealth, because I never asked myself the question of like, what's the, the average adult wealth? Uh, and it's apparently 85,000. And if you think that, like, compare 85,000 with like 300,000 um, Satoshis, that's like, that's amazing. And then there's, inflation coming along uh, and it's really interesting to, to look at the, the, those numbers of like the average wealth right now of an individual and then think of like in a bitcoin standard world it's hard to predict the timing of that when when there is a bitcoin standard and, and when it will be there uh, and bitcoin will be that dominant but the average wealth of then uh, or having like 300,000 Bitcoin, maybe even lower than that because we have lost some Bitcoin and uh, the, the the distribution is uneven. Like there will be pe people that have one Bitcoin and there will be people that have 10 Bitcoin. There will be people that have like 100,000 Bitcoin and, and more than that. So like uh, it's probably more like, like 200,000 or like 100,000 or something like that. Uh, so maybe even like 85,000 Satoshis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as now with the Satoshi's dollars parity, it's really interesting to look at that. Uh, I love how you see it. Yeah, no, and um, to speak on the average one more time, like you have to understand, there's gonna come a point where the average income for everyone in America will be one million dollars, and that's like, whoa, that's insane. There's no way that's possible, bro. You need to understand, eighty-five thousand. If you had eighty-five thousand, like fifty years ago. You're pretty rich, okay? If you had $85,000 and that was your, like, average income in 1970, you're, you're very wealthy. You're extremely wealthy. If you take it back another 50, if you go back 100 years and you have $85,000, you're rich. You are literally rich in real life, all right? But now, if you have $85,000, you are doing okay, all right? In some places, you're poor. Okay, if you have 85,000 in like Boston or like certain places in New York or like San Francisco, certain places in California, like you're not really wealthy. You're not like super rich. You're barely average. You know, uh, you might be a below average. You know, it might be kind of hard for you to find a place to live comfortably if you're by yourself doing 85. Right. Uh, and there's going to come a point where eventually that continues. That's going to continue even in uh, a place where like the cost of living is low, like uh, Louisiana or like Mississippi. Uh, the average income there will become 85,000, which means the average income in a place like New York will be like 200,000, 300,000. But these people won't be richer. They will just need more pieces of paper to buy stuff. Okay. Good example is eggs, eggs from today, eggs 50 years ago, eggs a hundred years ago. If you want to talk about antibiotics and steroids and all this other stuff, for the most part, the eggs are the same. They're just eggs. They come from chickens. Okay. They're just eggs. But the price of eggs has gone up 5, 10 X. Why does this keep happening? The price never goes down, only goes up. It's not that the eggs are more valuable. The eggs require more pieces of paper for you to purchase. Your pieces of paper have gone down in value. That is a really important concept for people to understand. But like most people don't even frame their mind in that way. You know, it's always like, oh, no, the price of eggs is getting more expensive. We can produce more eggs per person because our technology and our ability to farm and manufacture eggs has gotten a lot better. We actually produce more eggs. That means the price should be going down, but the price is actually going up because our, our money is being inflated faster than we can uh, deflate the cost of eggs. Uh, Jeff Booth has an entire book on that. It's called The Price of Tomorrow. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. I just want to point something out and uh, I love it a lot. Uh, are you telling there's like one tool I like? I don't know if uh, what tool you are using usually, uh, but that's I like it because it's an online tool. Uh, the Bitcoin file calculator. Did you see that already sometime? Mm, no, I have a website. It's called uh, Priced in Bitcoin. Uh, and that also shows something very interesting. It shows how on a chart, everything goes down in cost if you're saving in Bitcoin. But this is awesome. Tell me about this. 
Yeah, it's interesting um, because it's basically there are like different models of like how Bitcoin will uh, appreciate uh, the next few years. And it's interesting because you said like you think the compound uh, annual growth rate will go up. But there it's actually like even the most bullish model, like the Model 7, uh, assumes that it goes down significantly. Yeah. And if you just like take that and take like the the middle model, the Model 4, and put like 0 0.1 Bitcoin in there, and as you said, I think you said before 2045, uh, and and then from 2045, you then take out um, uh, $30,000. But probably that's probably the the thing that you you uh, is is wrong because here you probably need more in dollars <laughs> if the dollar is still around, and and yeah. maybe it's not called called dollars, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Tax rate is also hard to calculate because it's different for everyone in the in the world. Uh, but just like that uh, small. Uh, starting point with like 3,000 euros uh, and you you calculate that down then to 2045, you really get into big numbers where you have in the first year where you want to take something out already like this 450,000 euros uh, and uh, then like uh, just like eight years later, you over a million. So I think, I think uh, those models are uh, interesting, but I think they are assuming that we don't have hyperinflation and that inflation stays in the, under control. And that's always my uh, problem with those models where you're like, I think inflation will be way worse than most people think right now. How do you foresee uh, inflation uh, within the next like couple of, of decades and years maybe. Uh, and do you think that, that we have a chance of having normal, <laughs> normal inflation, even though I don't think inflation is normal at all. Right. Uh, right. But like normal inflation, I mean like having like a three, four, five percent uh, inflation target, even like we we all know like inflation is not calculated from a zero point. We have to calculate the productivity offset in there. Uh, yeah. Then inflation is not CPI. Inflation is whatever you want to buy. But let's take that all besides. <laughs> Do you think that even like CPA will will stay like maybe five percent or something like that? Um, I just don't think it's possible. So inflation is like a compounding issue, right? Uh, once it starts to get out of hand you can't really rein it in. So at least in the United States, I'm pretty sure the debt to GDP is like 130% currently, right? Like America has bills that they cannot pay. So what they're doing is they're taking a credit card to pay off a credit card to pay off the last credit card, right? Now, the, the question is, Jack Maulers asked this question a lot. Uh, who's going to pay the bill? Who's going to realize the loss, right? And the loss is realized through individuals. It, the, the loss is realized in a very sneaky way. All right. And it's by inflating uh, the money away so that you have a higher cost of living and the people who borrow money get to continually stay uh, afloat because they just get to borrow infinitely. Right. There's no cost to them. The cost is on us. So on top of that, you have certain things that you just can't pay for. So we have trillions of dollars of unfunded liabilities. That's Social Security. That's Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, all these different things that we're promising people, hey, don't worry, we're going to take care of you in the future. This is another reason why Gen Z needs Bitcoin. Why am I paying for Social Security if it's going to run out in 2030, 2035? Anyway, that's not even going to, I'm not even going to be able to use it. And I pay for it every check. Uh, it seems kind of, seems kind of like a scam, right? Uh, if I'm going to be uh, paying into these uh, government funded programs that won't be funded by me anyway, what are the two options that they have? Maybe three. They can increase my taxes even more, right? They can uh, print more money and go into debt and just print the money for the uh, for the old people. Or um, they can just get rid of the programs. But hey, guys, you know what? No more Social Security, no more Medicaid. Sorry, you're on your own. And none of those seem attractive, but most likely they're going to foot the bill to me. Hey, we're just going to increase your tax rate even more, even though it's already like 41%. Uh, when it comes to natural disaster, Florida just had two hurricanes back to back, really bad ones. Uh, FEMA, right, which is our like disaster relief group here in America. Uh, they are basically saying, yeah, we're bankrupt. Like we have no money. There's too many natural disasters. We don't have enough funding. And there's always going to be tornadoes, earthquakes, massive fires, hurricanes. Um, whether you want to blame that on a change in the climate or whatever you want to say, regardless, they are happening. 
and someone has to pay for that stuff. Uh, and you don't have the money. You just got to print it. The military budget is literally smaller than the interest on the debt. All right. So there's no way out of the hole. We don't have enough productivity. We don't have enough money coming in to pay for all the money going out. That's called being insolvent, right? The United States is insolvent and soon the game will unwind. That's why all these BRICS countries are getting into buying gold and buying Bitcoin and mining Bitcoin. And um, I think they see the writing on the wall pretty soon. The average person will also see the writing on the wall and the deficit will affect them in a really direct way. Right now, it affects them indirectly. Soon it'll be direct and impossible to ignore. So it's interesting when you talk about uh, taxes, because like in a Bitcoin world, um, you don't really have the possibility to have the inflation tax on, on top of pe people. What do you think will that impact uh, society, individuals, governments, when all of a sudden this hidden tax that everyone feels, but nobody really can point to because they're like, they just know that prices go up, but most people don't know that it's because of the money printing. Like if you go out on the street, I bet you like nine people out of 10 say as an answer, like, oh, because Ukraine war, <laughs> yes. because, because Russia, because of whatever, but they don't point to the actual real reason why we have inflation. What happens if we don't have that anymore? Yeah, no, I think, um, and you're completely right. I'm actually going to start doing street interviews where I'm going to give people Satoshis for answering questions about Bitcoin. That's how I'm going to try to stand out in my niche. But um, it's definitely something people don't think about. And they're not totally wrong when you say, oh, because the United States is going to war. Yes, like partially, that is part of the problem. The United States has so many proxy wars going on at once and we're funding them. How are we funding them? We're funding them by printing money. How do we print money? We issue debt. We issue treasury. We issue bonds. And that comes back to bite you uh, eventually, right? Back in the day, if you wanted to go and fight a war, you had to get with the citizens and be like, all right, listen, guys, we're going to increase taxes. We're going to have a little bit of a depression. Things aren't going to be great, but we have to fight this war. Who's with me, right? And if they wanted to fight the war, they say, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's go smash those guys, right? But today, no one wants to go fight these wars. They don't know anything about the Ukrainians or Russians or Israelis or Palestinians. They don't. The average American knows nothing about this stuff anyway. And when you tell them we're going to war to go fight them, they're like, why? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't even know them. And you're going to tax me and you're going to make me poor to go to the war. No, I'm not funding that. But today you don't need permission from citizens. You just go do the war and then print the money later. Right. So that's how we get caught up in the system in terms of how it will affect people. It, it, it leads people to get their time back. So I actually wanted to talk about this. I, I have a couple of stats here. Uh, so how do we get our time back with Bitcoin? Uh, because the amount that people will have to work if the inflation tax goes away, the inflation theft goes away, you get a lot of hours back. So some numbers. Uh, in 1970, right, the, this is based off the minimum wage. The amount of minimum wage hours you had to work in order to go to college, public four-year university, you had to work about 246 minimum wage hours. Today, you have to work 1,500 minimum wage hours, right? To get a car in 1970, you needed to work about 2,100 minimum wage hours. Today, you'd have to work 6,600, so three times more minimum wage hours to get the average car. And then finally, for a house, 1970, you needed about 14,000 minimum wage hours. Today, you're going to need about 57,000. So again, nearly three times, a little bit more than three times more minimum wage hours to get the average house okay uh that means you are literally losing time when inflation goes up they are stealing your time your most valuable asset is being stolen from you and if you can get your time back you're able to focus on the things that you care about the things that matter to your life your passions okay your passions might not be uh monetizable right you might not be able to monetize your passion because of that that might steer you away from doing your passion, okay? It's like, oh, well, if I can't make money doing it, then I can't feed myself and I can't do it and I can't whatever, whatever. With Bitcoin, I think more people will be able to follow their creative passion, uh, their life's mission, right? Nobody's life mission is to be a greeter at Walmart. It's not their life mission. I really don't believe that. You have a greater life mission and Bitcoin allows you to pursue that because uh, you don't have to worry about the money. 
you just have to worry about living your life. Mm. I, I laughed at a lot. Also, like the uh, making things affordable again, like taking the the monetary premium out of uh, housing, uh, taking the monetary premium out of weird things, and then making everything more affordable. I, I, I love that. Uh, bringing time uh, as the most valuable asset back in the world. I think Bitcoin really, Bitcoin really will shine a light on that. And I just was like in, in Amsterdam a, a few days ago, uh, or like when this comes out a few weeks ago, uh, and this is where I saw so many people who really value their time a lot. And I'm not talking about the people that work in Bitcoin or something like that. I work about the, uh, I talk about the people that work a normal job, yeah. normal in terms of not Bitcoin, <clears throat> but they are at the Bitcoin conference because they're interested in it and they really value the time differently. Like not even the people that work in Bitcoin, obviously they are way deeper in that, but even the people that just adopt the Bitcoin standard for themselves, like it's, it's crazy what Bitcoin does to us. Yeah, no, and uh, to speak on the time thing one more time, like uh, a way to think about it is you have to frame it like this, right? not only are you working three times harder to get the same thing that someone else had in the past, um, you have to think of your job. Like when you go to work, when you have your job, right, you kind of already know all the days that are scheduled out in front of you. Okay. If you project that you're going to stay at your job for 10 years and you work Monday through Friday, if where there was a calendar in front of you, all of those Monday through Fridays in the future are all booked, right? You know, okay, I have to be here at this time, this place to do this function. All those Monday through Fridays, they're all the way in the future. That's time that's already set aside that is um, taken from you, right? Because your time is dedicated towards someone else and making someone else rich. That's your time set up in the future. What Bitcoin does, right? And as you get richer, um, right? You're able to take days off the calendar. You're taking time from the future and you're bringing it to the present, right? You're taking that future time back. Okay. For instance, if you win the lottery, right, let's say you win a $10 billion lottery, all those days that you had scheduled for work, they technically go away. All the future time is gone. You take it to the present because all of your monetary energy that you would have made from working those days is now in the present. You were able to get that future value immediately by winning the lottery. When you buy Bitcoin, Bitcoin is slowly taking the value from those future days that you would have been working and it's bringing it to the present your value and your purchasing power is going up so fast that the amount of days you'll have to work is slowly getting cut down. It's slowly cutting those future days out. And then eventually you will more soon, sooner rather than later, you'll be able to um, enjoy your present, right? Bitcoin allows you to enjoy your present. Um, ironically, you actually have to not consume in the present in order to enjoy it. Uh, but it, it, it's a game of, of patience. Right. You buy Bitcoin, you wait, you continue to stack, and eventually you will be able to consume 10 times more than you would have had you used an impulse buy. Impulse buy. You control your impulse today in order to prosper tomorrow. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, also, like the, I think you had, I think it was you that also had a, a video around like Bitcoin is a bank inside your brain. I did not see yes. the video, but I, I yeah. saw the title when I saw, saw your saw YouTube page. I was like, that's an amazing concept. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, like how, why is that? Like what, what, what is your like thesis behind Bitcoin is a bank inside your brain? Uh, why is that? Like, okay. And this is really harder for privileged people to realize, but when you're not as privileged, you need to realize Jews in World War II, uh, a lot of people in World War II, really, um, even Japanese people in World War II, Vietnamese people during like the Vietnam War, uh, Cubans during like uh, Fidel Castro's like um, rise to power and like communism. If they had assets, they had to try to leave because they didn't want to have their assets socialized. Um, uh, people in China, you know what I mean, uh, in, in multiple times through history, there are many times through history where people are persecuted and they have to leave where they're at. Okay. Regardless of whatever reason they have to leave or they're going to die. Okay. Rwandans. Okay. Rwandan genocide. Okay. You could say, uh, Palestinians today. You could say Israelis today, whatever you want to say, someone is being persecuted and they have to leave or they're going to get smoked. All right. When you have to leave, you can't take your house. You can't take your business. 
You can't take your bank. You cannot take your stocks. You can't even take your gold. You try to bring your gold through an airport today. Try to bring three bars of gold through an airport. They're going to scan it. It's going to beep. They're going to be like, what is this guy doing? What is this guy doing? Did you steal this? Yeah, you stole it. Matter of fact, we're going to hold on to this. Thank you. Right? Try going through an airport with $500,000. Right? Please try that. Put that in a duffel bag. They're going to scan it. They're going to be like, oh, this guy is a, this guy's a scammer and a thief. All right, something's going on here. Something's wrong with this guy. Something's weird is happening here. Here, we're going to pull you to the side. We're going to ask you a couple questions, all right? Especially if you're trying to leave the place, right? If you're one of the bad guys, okay, one of the people being persecuted, and you try to leave, they're going to question you, and they're going to take all your stuff, all right? Bitcoin is a brain bank. Bitcoin is your Bank of America inside your head. It is your stocks inside your head. When you know 12 words, right? I have my 12 words memorized. I can get on a plane and come to where you live. You know what I mean? I could go to your house and I have all my economic energy because you have an internet connection. And I'm saying, hey man, can I get on your computer? I need to download my money. You know what I mean? I need to I need to get my money really quick. You know, and that's really all there is to it. And that is amazing. No one can take your Bitcoin from you. And you can never lose it as long as you remember. Right? So that's very powerful. That's super powerful. Uh, not only that, you can send remittance. You know, if I want to send money to you, you're in a different country, obviously. There's going to be a fee if I use Western Union, if I use Remitly. I can send money to you for free. There's a fee that you pay on the Bitcoin network, right? Because you have to pay the miners. Miners do work. The least I can do is pay them a small fee. I can pay Robin without having to have a middleman in between. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. Absolutely, and I, <laughs> I brought that up in the podcast or quite a quite a lot actually, uh, because I think it's a, such a great example. Um, I have a sponsor of Coin Vigilante. The, they are sitting in America, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sitting obviously in Austria. Uh, and we first wanted to go the route with like a fiat payment and putting the banking route numbers and all those things, and then we're like, that's. That's so complicated. We didn't even get to the point where we discussed the fees of this uh, transfer, but we were before that already. We're like, oh man, that's such a headache. I don't even know where this banking routing number is in my fiat bank because I've never did a, a transfer over that long. Uh, and then I was like, hey, let's let's just let's just do it with Bitcoin. Like, why not just? do the uh, transfer in Bitcoin and it was on a Sunday evening and it was done in like under 10 minutes and he sent it. I got it. It was perfect. It was on chain. It was on Bitcoin. The fees was so, so small, like 0.001% or something like that of the total amount. Like it was ridiculously small, uh, the fees. So it's like, it, it's, it's an amazing experience. And everyone, I think that sends money, around the globe from like, I don't know, Ukraine to, or Ukraine is an extreme example, but maybe even like uh, Hungary to, to the States or to Australia, uh, they will see that uh, it is so much easier. So I just wanted to emphasize your point uh, with like a real world example, because it is so much easier. <laughs> it's like yeah. no headache at all. And like, like you have to think when we have new technology, People are so used to like TikTok and things going fast. I'm like, I need now, 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 now. Dude, be humble, okay? Calm down, little bro. Just, just breathe. We have to take time for technology to work. The first people to use credit cards, I guarantee you, the first people to use credit cards, they walk into a place I'm like, here, I'm going to use my plastic to pay. Not everywhere was accepting credit cards, okay? You need to wait for the infrastructure to be built out. All right. People probably made fun of them. They're like, dude, you can't pay with plastic. You're an idiot. <laughs> Look at this nerd. He's using a credit card. Like, dude, let them work. Let them cook. Okay. Let them build stuff. And eventually everything gets easier and easier. Why are they going to continue to build it? Because I guarantee you the person who invented the, um, the on rail for the credit card is rich. Entrepreneurs are looking to solve problems. So the more people who make things like the liquid network, the lightning network, all right, uh, who are making different Bitcoin wallets, who are integrating like Apple and, you know, Bitcoin together. People who are doing these type of things, they're going to make a lot of money. You're solving a problem. You're reducing the friction and you're making it easier for people to pay and use Bitcoin. All right. Now I can pay people 
using Cash App. Cash App is my easy way. I'm just like, hey, let me send you 10,000 Satoshis or let me send you 100,000. Let me cover the dinner here. I scan it and it shows people, oh, that was actually pretty easy, you know, and it's only going to get easier. Eventually, we're going to have a card the same way we do right now. And we're going to tap our card and that'll pay in Satoshis. You just have to give people time to build the technology. Not everything happens in one day. You just have to give it time. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit a bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much that's why i think satoshi nakamoto is the biggest and best founder ever because he solved the biggest <laughs> uh, problem ever with like where do I store my financial energy? Like that's 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 a huge problem, and he just like solved that with a small white paper with a few pages. Like that's that's still amazing for me to think about. Yeah. But one thing that uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, point out uh, when you mentioned the airport, which is really interesting for me. Um, do you think at some point they will start uh, looking at like hardware wallets when <laughs> when you go through the airport? Uh, do we do we have to hide our our hardware wallets in like uh, laptop things? Like there's like hardware wallets I know that look like a phone. <laughs> yeah. So, but 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 still they are kind of suspicious. I, I I guess we have to make a hardware wallet that looks like an iPhone that that uses like take with you and it's just like it it just looks exactly like an iPhone and you, you don't even know the difference uh till you really like activate it or something like that. Uh do you think that that could be a problem? Here's the thing. This is what's amazing. You don't need the hardware wallet. Like the hardware wallet doesn't actually hold the Bitcoin. It's about being able to move your keys and sign transactions, right? So right now I could smash my hardware wallet into pieces and my Bitcoin will be okay because I know the recovery seed. Um, and when you know the 12 words, you don't have to bring the wallet. If anyone asks you any questions, dude, I don't even know what Bitcoin is. And matter of fact, Bitcoin's a scam. Bitcoin's a scam. What do you mean, officer? I don't know what that is. Uh, let me through the airport, please. Thank you. And then you get on the plane. You have your 12 words in your head and you can go wherever you're going. Like, that's amazing. You don't need the hardware wallet. It's about you studying your 12 words three times a day. Uh, that, that's extreme. That's if you want to really memorize it. But you write down your 12 words. You read it before bed. You do that for a week. You plan your escape. You get your passport. And then you leave. You, you can leave everything else. It's fine. You can leave. And you can bring your money with you. You can bring your economic value with you. Right? So I think that's so amazing and powerful. It's awesome. Absolutely. You you said you are from America, right? Yes, yes. 
It's, it's interesting. Um, what what do you think Bitcoin will do for people that weren't um, born in in let's say more privileged countries like you in America or me in Austria, where like uh, like even like the the under the 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 the, the more poor uh, half of the civilization is still like way better off than in some other parts of the country what do you think uh, bitcoin will do to the let's say let's call it the victims of the fiat system yeah no <laughs> the for fiat real. money system yeah no uh, 100% like um, we're already kind of seeing it right we could say el salvador was a poor country Right. They don't have a high GDP, like they don't have a really high net worth per per capita. Um, so we'll just use El Salvador as a great example. El Salvador so far has been able to reduce their crime massively. They've been able to boost their economy massively. They're increasing the standard of living for the people who are who are there. And they're also moving away from having to rely on the IMF, the International Monetary uh, Fund and the World Bank. They're moving away from them. They don't need their debt. They are now self-sovereign. That is insane. And they're, they're, they're going to be more well off than a lot of Western countries. All right. In my opinion, I think that the true first world, and if you ask people in comparative politics, they're going to say, well, there is no first, third or second world. That doesn't, that isn't real. That's just a term that we use. But like in, in the, in the third world, all these countries are going to leap over they're going to jump over like if, if the united states is here or let's just say any country that has no bitcoin right now if you're in the western world germany 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 is a western country it's a pretty good country right um germany is right here they have no bitcoin in the future bhutan uh, argentina uh costa rica uh el salvador they're going to jump over germany all right they're going to literally leap over them and germans will have to realize oh wait a minute we're actually losing to people who have harder money than us. That's why, again, Bitcoin standard, you cannot ignore someone who has harder money than you. It's just not possible that you, you cannot be delusional enough. It's not possible to do that because you're going to watch your life get worse and you're going to watch their life get better. And if you're rational, you're going to try to get on the same standard as them. Absolutely. I, I love that a lot. It's like that, that sound money standard and that, I think that's the best way to orange peel people being that positive role model that has their savings in Bitcoin. Therefore, they get better time. Therefore, they get to be more happy. Therefore, they get to be more uh, spending time with things they actually love doing. And uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to see um, family members reacting to that. Because even like in my family, even though my, like my family, there is nobody really poor. They're all like middle class. There's nobody really extremely rich or nobody really extremely poor. Like it's an average kind of middle uh, class family in Austrian standards. Yeah. Um, but they see already that I'm doing every day what I love to do. I don't go to a job that I hate and I'm just like so young and i just like do on the internet and interview people every day i mean i work really hard like i work like 70 80 hours sometimes in a week yeah uh, but i i i do it with full passion and i love doing that and even if you would give me like uh, a million euros per month i would still do that i i, I like doing that i i hate <laughs> just laying on the beach or something like that but Maybe that's, I don't know how much this has to do with Bitcoin, uh, but showing your environment that you're happy, successful, and, and good uh, will orange peel people if they connect you to Bitcoin. I think yep. that's the best way to passively orange peel people. <laughs> yes. Uh, how much time do we have left? Do you know? Oh, you, you, we can go uh, long as, as you want. Like Okay. Um, okay, listen, that is so true. And I wanted to talk about, let's like transition, like how do we advertise Bitcoin? Technically, Bitcoin does not need advertisers, right? It does it by itself. But um, at the same time, we want to accelerate adoption because we want to try to help the people that we care about, right? Even the people we don't care about, uh, technically don't care. Like, I don't know all the people watching this. So you could say, I don't know you. I don't really care about you. Like, I don't know you watching this. But regardless, you're human and you were born on Earth. So I have some sort of obligation to you. That's my obligation to you. I feel like if we were born on the same planet, 
then I have some level of obligation to try to help you. You know what I mean? I have no reason or no incentive to hate you or to try to hurt you. I only have an incentive to try to help you. Now, if you give me a reason to hate you, then yeah, what I'll say is, okay, you know what? You should go save dollars and put them under your bed. Put them under your mattress. That's what I'll tell you if I hate you because I know that'll make you poor, right? But because you know, you want to try to help people, you tell them, hey, you know, you should try to invest into something uh, or try saving in because you're not necessarily investing in Bitcoin. Uh, an investment is something you plan to sell in the future. I think you should try to save in Bitcoin. Saving in Bitcoin gives it the connotation that that's your new money, right? And um, being like a positive and uh, just knowledgeable and helpful person is the best way to advertise for Bitcoin. Living on a Bitcoin standard is the best advertising for Bitcoin. And there's going to be people who will make fun of you. They will kind of ask you sarcastic things, right? Uh, when Bitcoin goes down, they will laugh at you. They might talk about you behind your back. They might think that you're crazy. They might think that you're not actually very smart. They will think that they are smarter than you. They know more than you. Um, and in some cases, you know what? Maybe they do. But when it comes to Bitcoin and what Bitcoin represents, you have to have a certain level of humility and realize that many people, anyone who's ever really tried to change something in the world, uh, they had to endure a little bit of pushback. Some people, that was physical violence. To be fair, they're not beating up Bitcoiners in the street. So we're very privileged. We just get made fun of and called idiots online. And that's okay, right? It's not about you yelling back like, no, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Like, no, like you have to be humble and be like, okay, that's fine. When you are ready, I'm here. When you're ready, I'm here. Because everyone has a, like a bit of an ego and we all want to like rub it in the faces of people who are mean to us. But rubbing it in their face is owning Bitcoin. <laughs> that is rubbing it in their face. It's like, oh my God, this guy bought it when it was 60 and now it's a million. Oh my God. You know what I mean? That is rubbing it in their face. So uh, there's no need to be rude. It's just about being informational and trying to help people. Easier said than done, but you do have to just be humble. Yeah, and that's one thing that I've noted with all my guests. They are extremely humble. They're extremely kind. There's like, obviously, there's like in every community, at least like a small portion uh, of people that are not that. Uh, but it's for me outstanding what how high the rate of humble and kind and loving and caring people in in bitcoin are like it, it's it's outstanding for me they're like i my prime example for that is jeff booth like he is probably the most humble and kind guy uh, and additionally to that so successful and and, yeah. and so uh good in life like he doesn't need to be humble. Like he, he can actually brag about his achievement, but he chooses not to because he's a humble and kind guy. Yeah. Can uh, I, and can I, yeah, yeah, please, sorry, please sorry. go ahead. Like, just to cut in right here. I'm sorry to cut your thought off, but this is so important. Why is it like, let's try to ask why. Why is it that so many Bitcoiners are so humble and kind? Why is that? I think it's because Bitcoin literally incentivizes cooperation, whereas everything else in life incentivizes individualism. Let me explain. At least for me, when you go to school, it's about, hey, listen, keep your eyes on your own paper, okay? Keep your head down. We literally had, I don't know about you, we had dividers. You would literally take a, like a cardboard divider and divide your desk so that no one else could see you or talk to you when it was time to work on homework or do tests or something like that. And when you think about it, yes, you don't want people just cheating off someone else. That doesn't help them to learn. But imagine a classroom where you say, okay, listen. The only way that everyone passes is if everyone understands the concepts that we're going over, okay? So work together, everyone figure out how you're going to explain and understand and pass this test. Like, what about a collaborative type of classroom? You go to work, it's like, okay, listen, you're against everybody, okay? You're trying to step on these other guys so that you can climb the corporate ladder. You know what I mean? It's There's no cooperation in the workplace, even though being collaborative is very important to succeeding. Even in business, it's like, oh, it's super cutthroat, okay? I would literally, the, the CEO of McDonald's at one point, he said if my competition was drowning, I would stick a hose in their mouth. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I understand, yeah, business a little bit cutthroat. But imagine a world where everybody is collaborating, right? What about a world where everyone's working together, all right, instead of trying to undercut people and cut them down and pull them down, right? Bitcoin is about collaborating. Bitcoin only works if you collaborate. 
So I think that because the network, because the math of Bitcoin is collaborative, it makes the people collaborative as well. That's what I think. Why, why do you think, uh, like, under, is that because w when I, like, if I make a bunch of money, uh, I save everything in Bitcoin and that's good for you also because you also save in Bitcoin. Is, is that the reason why Bitcoin connects us and is kind of making us humble and uh, making us collaborate with other people? That might be one reason. But the second reason I would say is because doing the opposite of that is not maybe not the opposite, but like trying to attack the network is not incentivized. So trying to be an individual is not incentivized. So what I what I mean by that is if you're the type of person who's like, you know what, I'm going to use all my electricity in my house to try to guess Bitcoin wallets instead of working to mine a block and boosting the hash rate. I'm just going to try to guess wallets all day and steal someone's Bitcoin. Uh, and that's why Bitcoin's so secure. I have a video. Literally, what are the odds of someone stealing your Bitcoin? Uh, and it's it's 10 to the 77. And that might sound like it's not that big of a number. There are only 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire universe, right? So you guessing my wallet is you guessing the same atom that I pick, right? That's insane. Um, so plus, plus then, uh, then, uh, multi-signature <laughs> wallets yeah, yeah. Where, where you maybe have to cast free or something like that. Sorry. I no, to do. like, and that, that's another thing. That's just a normal wallet, a multi-sig wallet. You would never, like, it's not possible. So when you're trying to attack the network, you only get poorer. If you try doing a 51% attack, it's not possible. The hash rate's too big. You only get poorer. You try to steal people's Bitcoin. You only get poorer. You never find anyone's Bitcoin. You never find it. It's not possible. Um, when it comes to you trying to run evil nodes that like your nodes are trying to run a software that says, no, the, the, the Bitcoin network actually has 41 million Bitcoin, not 21 million. No one's going to use your network. You're wasting electricity. You're just getting poorer. Uh, it, basically, if you're not working together with people, you get poorer. Okay. This is the wall of Bitcoin that secures the network. This is you trying to penetrate. It's not going to work. You just get poorer and you look like an idiot. Everyone's going to make fun of you. You know, they're like, look at this guy. He's trying to like steal people's Bitcoins. He's been trying to steal people's Bitcoins since 2009. He hasn't found a single one. He's wasting electricity. He's getting poorer. If he was mining Bitcoin, he probably would have got some by now. You know what I mean? Um, even mining pools. Mining pools are a collaborative effort. It's everyone putting their electricity towards mining a block. It's another form of cooperation. Everything about Bitcoin involves cooperating. That's an amazing insight that everything in Bitcoin is incentivized for you to join the network and not uh, attack the network. I, I love that a lot. Really cool. Uh, before we come closer to the end, um, I want to ask you about the current situation of Bitcoin. We have... I feel like the, 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 we are kind of like the, the starting of a, maybe a major bull cycle. Maybe we're the starting at like a, a hill in front of us. Um, how do you assess the, the current situation with Bitcoin ETFs, with corporate adoption, with even nation state adoption from El Salvador? Uh, what do you expect uh, in, in the coming months and uh, years? All right. This is where we get into the, the moon math, as we call it, right? Right now we're in October. Um, and right now we're kind of flat. But you just have to give Bitcoin time. Everyone wants to rush it. They want things to go on their time. Bitcoin is going to go at its time, okay? Not yours. So you have to be humble. And um, me personally, I think this is one of those moments where people will look back in history and be like, they'll kick themselves. They'll be like, why? Why did I not? You know? Because the 2025 bull run can change your life. It really can change your life because... What does change your life mean? It's different for everyone. But someone putting in $600 and then having 6000 in a year, you know what I mean? A 10x, that will change their life, right? Um, even a 2x ch change, could change their situation for just a little bit. It can make them a little bit happier. It could take off a little bit of pressure. Uh, and the reason why I say that there's no way that the adoption curve is going to, in terms of like the rate of return, the cumulative rate of return is not going down. I don't buy that. And the reason why is, again, only 3% of people are using Bitcoin in the world. So how could the annual growth rate go down? It has to go up exponentially because we, we're not even at 50%. You know, um, countries are not all mining Bitcoin. Only a very few are mining Bitcoin. The ETFs, yeah, it's a big deal. But um, imagine when companies start getting into, imagine when banks start getting into 
buying and holding Bitcoin? What's going to happen? You know what I mean? So I think right now we're looking at a, if you look at the Bitcoin chart and then you zoom in to all the times before it blew up, it looked exactly like this, right? It looked exactly like what it looks like right now. And people always think, well, dude, it's not going to go up to, it's not going to go up to $5. Are you insane? It's only five cents right now. Then later. Okay. Well, it's not going to go up to $50. It's only five, $5 right now. Then a little bit later, you know, Hey dude, it's not going to go up to 500. It's only $50 right now. Then 50,000 right now. Let's just call it 50,000. Dude, it can't go up to 500,000. Are you crazy? So I think that's a game that will continue to go on and on and on. Um, but as long as it stays scarce and money keeps getting printed, the only way for Bitcoin to go is up and to the right. Absolutely. Uh, really, really cool. Um, I have one more question for you. Why did you start uh, advocating publicly for, for Bitcoin? You have your YouTube channel, uh, you have a Twitter account, uh, you're putting out videos, you're putting your, 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 your face uh, out there. Uh, and you are, uh, as I call it, a, a digital soldier for, for Bitcoin, which I absolutely love. And I appreciate uh, do you spending your time in Bitcoin and advocating for it publicly. And I encourage everyone <laughs> to do it. Uh, and I also encourage everyone who wants to do that, like just like contact me, send me a video of yourself. Uh, if, you, if you want, we can do a podcast. Uh, I love to discover new people. And yeah, like, but what's what's your reason? Why, why did you not, hide uh, and just like accumulate Bitcoin and, and hide away in, in the shadow? Why did you put yourself out there? Yeah. And I'm actually going to do um, a video about this, about why like it's okay to not want to advocate, right? Because some people, there's going to come a point where you're going to have a lot of money. You're going to have a lot of purchasing power and people might want to rob you, honestly, um, if you're like super public about your Bitcoin. Um, and that's something that I think all Bitcoiners might have to face at some point. Um, and you know, it's not as big of a deal now, but that's already happened many times. There's actually a list of Bitcoin attacks that have happened to people where they try to get their keys from them or whatever it is. And, um, I think that just, it comes with the territory, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that it was really Bitcoin university that inspired me to want to make videos because his were so simple. He doesn't make a bunch of editing or a bunch of whatever it's as basic as it gets. And he is like a great beacon of education. Uh, he, he, whether he realizes it or not, he's a hero. Uh, any, anybody who makes Bitcoin content, like Robin, you are literally a hero. That is not an understatement. Uh, you know what I mean? And um, it might seem like, oh, no, that, that's too much. Like, don't say that. I'm too humble. But if you look back at this in the future, people will be like, wow, that guy literally saved my life. Because had I not watched that podcast, I probably would have never started my journey. You know? So... If you could stop the people from in like Weimar, Germany, you know, World War II, if you knew hyperinflation was coming and there was a way to like, hey, man, uh, I'm going to be able to save you so that you don't die of hunger. You know, you will have been a hero for those people. So I think that that's what we are looking at right now. Uh, it might sound crazy now, but just give it a little bit of time. I think it won't sound so crazy. So I think that being a Bitcoin advocate is about trying to help as many people as I can. And because the world is full of so many scams and schemes, it's easy to be like, well, that's a pyramid scheme. Of course, this guy, he has a lot of Bitcoin. Of course, he's going to tell people to buy Bitcoin and get other people into it so that he can dump on them. You, there is nowhere to dump in terms of Bitcoin. I don't sell it for anything. There's nowhere for me to go. When it comes to crypto, like some random doggy meme coin. Yes, I need you to buy the doggy coin so that I can sell and dump on you so you can get poorer. I can get richer. There's nowhere for me to go from Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin, and then there's nowhere else. I can't sell it for anything else. Like, there's nowhere else to go. You know what I mean? There's no, there's nothing to dump it for. Why would I? Why would I? You know, it's just, it takes time. But yeah, that's why. Absolutely, that's it's so funny. Um, <laughs> when when someone comes to me like, oh, you're just advocating for pe people for Bitcoin because you want to bump the price, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> you think really highly of me that you think that I have the ability <laughs> to move the Bitcoin price. Like, <laughs> like uh, I, I don't think, um, like maybe uh, Elon Musk can move the Bitcoin price to a certain extent for a short amount of time. Yeah. At least in 2021, he did. Um, like, like someone like really high up the ladder, if he um, focuses and concentrate a lot of wealth, he might be able 
in like a few weeks times move the price a little bit up or a little bit down a few percent but not a lot like yeah. there has to be a major inflow or outflow of bitcoin to actually make a difference because that asset is a little bit bigger uh, than you might think uh, but it's way smaller than where, where it really goes so uh, i always take it as a compliment if someone tells me uh, oh you just want to pump the bitcoin price i'm like yeah thank you so much <laughs> that's, that, that's yeah, I'm a big dog it's big <laughs> Dog. That, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, no, obviously that's uh, that's that's a complete BS. Like obviously I, I'm uh, I'm not in nowhere near the position <laughs> that I can even like uh, move the Bitcoin price here one percent. But uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a good point for for me. Really really cool. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you also being in the Bitcoin scene and uh, advocating for it. I think we need as many digital soldiers as possible. But of course, yeah, everyone has the uh, the choice, and I respect that fully. Like I have already like a few people on that were on my podcast, but with no face uh, and no name. Uh, they just like were anonymous on with with their voice, uh, but even like they could. Uh, change their voice like that's that's like uh, super easy to do even on the internet i can literally do it with like one button click because i have like such a mixtape here so like it's really super easy to do um but yeah really cool i appreciate you uh coming on the show yeah no uh yeah go ahead go ahead sorry um um the i have an end routine where i always have two questions uh the one question is always the same for every guest and the other question is uh the the question from previous guests yes. the okay. one question that is always the same um is what can we learn from you besides uh bitcoin okay uh really quick before i do this uh one other thing i want to say about publicly advocating for bitcoin and people getting attacked for bitcoin uh again bitcoin incentivizes cooperation if you try to rob me for my bitcoin you, you literally can't. I mean, it's up to me to tell you the keys. Um, it's the only thing that you can actually, and I'm not advocating that you do this, but it's the only thing that you can actually die for and take to the grave. If you have money and I come rob you, uh, Michael Saylor uses this example. They can still shoot you and take the money. They can never get the Bitcoin if you just don't tell them. So like it, it makes people incentivized not to try to rob people. You know what I mean? Like it incentivizes people to just get Bitcoin and hold it and wait. You know what I mean? We will probably live in a society that is extremely low crime, you know, because theft will not be incentivized. There'll be no reason to try to rob people or steal people's money because uh, it won't be possible, especially if you have multi-signature, it will literally be impossible to steal someone's money. If they have a multi-sig, even if they gave you the keys, they could give you the keys and you wouldn't be able to take it because it's multi-sig. It's not possible. So it actually disincentivizes violence. So I think it's not it's not dangerous to do what I'm doing um, because there's no incentive to try to rob people. Truly incredible. As for sorry about that, but as for what we can learn in terms of from me um, uh, outside of Bitcoin, um, that's a really good question. I would say that um, what you can learn is that you can do amazing stuff without needing a bunch of funding or backing or experience or whatever it is you know what i mean i um started on this bitcoin journey and right now my channel is super small uh, my net worth is super small but um it's slowly been growing my confidence has grown my net worth has grown my ability to talk on camera has grown my ability to explain things has grown my understanding of the economy and of the world and of politics has grown a huge amount and all i had to do was get focused and get on to a um, like a routine of educating myself. I guess what you can learn from me is you can learn anything. You know what I mean? You don't have to necessarily go in debt to do it. Now, if you want to be a doctor or a certain type of engineer, yeah, I'd say go to school for sure. But if you want to understand the world better and you want to increase your knowledge, you can do that. You live in the information age. You have access to so much. And it's just about telling yourself and understanding that you can do it too. You know, Robin has... 10k subscribers, I can I can have 10k, you know, like you can do what other people do. You know, you don't have to be someone special. Everybody's normal. Everybody's normal. So that's what I'd say. Absolutely.
because uh, I had zero subscribers just 11 months ago. <laughs> so it's li literally like a, a really possible, which shocks me, honestly, um, which makes me really humble and grateful for, for that. Uh, but it goes to show you, like, if you really dedicate yourself to something, uh, it's, it's really cool. By the way, uh, congrats on your 100 subscribers. I think it's an amazing accomplishment uh, putting, because you did the, the most important step and you did the one step that most people fail this they never really start. They maybe make a video, or maybe they do two videos or three videos, but they never do more than that. Like they, they stop at some point. And if you just like keep going at it, and if you just like keep going with the video and video and video, uh, people like <laughs> you said before, uh, it's hard to ignore. It's impossible to ignore someone with hard money. Uh, it's completely impossible to ignore someone that just keeps going with the, the action. Like it's just yeah. like, it gets growing, it gets better. Uh, you get better. And it's like, um, uh, hundred subscriber. I, I know how, how, how that feels. And, and, uh, it's like, uh, it's, it's such an, uh, huge first milestone because you pro prove to yourself like, okay, I can do that. Like I, I can do a hundred, then I can do 200, then I can get to a thousand. If I can get to a thousand, why not go to a million? Like that, there's like no difference between gaining uh, the first hundred to the, a million. It's just like doing it longer and getting better every day a little bit. Um, and uh, it's 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 absolutely insane for me to be at ten thousand. I still can't really believe it. Uh, I still can't really like. I still think like I have two hundred subscribers or something like that. I still have like this. This <laughs> I'm still afraid that this is just bots or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you know what I mean. So uh, huge congratulations for your uh, f first efforts and for your first hundred subscribers. And I encourage everyone uh, that is watching that. Uh, uh, that video go go to his account it's chen c ptc i think it's the handle uh, and just like so, exactly it's it's even like um it's even rhyming a little bit i love it a lot and let maybe let's pump it up to like 200 or 300 whatever because this video will come out in 200 uh let's let's see uh, where we end up uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for being on already. I have one more question, the question the, from the previous guest. Uh, so the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Unfortunately, sorry, Dylan Leclerc, he was the first, uh, the previous guest. I forgot to ask him no, <laughs> what his question is. No. <laughs> Like he was literally right now at my house because he's in Vienna and we filmed the podcast in my apartment. Uh, and I completely forgot um, uh, to ask him, but I just made a question around the topic that we were discussing with Dylan. So like the most likely question that would, he would ask, uh, but I'm so sorry that, <laughs> that I forgot to ask him. Um, he's so, so kind to me that I completely forgot <laughs> to yeah. ask him. Um, I have the question from the topic of Dylan. Uh, what do you expect in the coming next years in terms of corporate Bitcoin adoption? Because we talked with Dylan about like S&P 500, uh, the fast we rule that will still come soon and kind of like this, the starting point of that micro strategy playbook being adopted by uh, way more companies and by way bigger companies even. Yeah, um, in terms of corporations, uh, not only will we see corporations adopting the big, the micro strategy strategy, we're going to see individuals more often than not adopting the micro strategy strategy. So I'm going to be honest, I'm doing the micro strategy trade, right? Like I'm doing a speculative attack on the dollar. So I actually took out loans, uh, some personal, some credit card, some from like my family or whatever. And I am in debt to buy Bitcoin. Some people will say that is a horrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Um, I've completely already paid off the debt. You know what I mean? Like that, that is insane. Cause I started this in 2023. Um, and Bitcoin goes up faster than your, than your debt. Right? So what people are going to do, this is more doable for companies. If you can borrow like micro strategy at 1%, 2% and Bitcoin has a compound annual growth rate of 55%, 60%, even 20. Okay. Let's say I'm wrong. And the, the rate starts to go down 20%. You're still making a guaranteed 18% just on the asset that you're holding. That's not on top of your business's revenue, right? So once we get more um, clarity in terms of banks being able to hold, because that's probably the main thing holding people back. Like companies don't want to leave their money with Coinbase, right? They want their money with banks that are too big to fail, if we're being honest. Uh, so they're going to want to have custodians that are institutional grade, 
who have a large amount of liquidity, a huge amount of assets under management, and a long history of being custodians and holding on to huge amounts of monetary value. And we're going to see tech companies realize, oh, wait, I can actually increase my profit margins by a huge amount just by having, uh, you know, this thing on my balance sheet. You know what I mean? Just by adding this to my reserve or to my treasury, I'm going to be increasing the market capitalization of my company by tenfold without having to do any extra work. You're not doing anything extra. Like you're 10xing. You are going to 10x your company by doing no extra work. Absolutely amazing. Why would you not do it? I think more people are going to be adopting this strategy, individuals and corporations. Uh, and that's going to be when we see, like, how can you expect the compound annual growth rate to go down when Dell, NVIDIA, Apple, all these mega companies start adopting? The mega companies aren't even here yet. And you think that the compound interest rate is going to go down? I don't see that happening. I just can't see it happening. I think we're going to explode upward. It's going to be insane. No one's going to be ready. I tend towards that, honestly. I, I try to be not completely excited about Bitcoin, like because I'm too excited, I think. And I try to lower my excitement a little bit and be like realistic about it. But I speak every time with a Bitcoiner and every day uh, with a Bitcoiner. And I cannot see Bitcoin not going parabolic up. Like it's really hard for me to imagine that we just like slowly, gradually, like I think it will go at some point like really parabolic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's interesting for me how, how, how fast that actually could go. But I, I, try, to, <laughs> I try to stay off the gas pedal and yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, like I'm fine with it. Like let's go, let's look at like 80K uh, next and maybe then let's do 90K. Yeah. But there could be that, there, there could be that night or like you turn off your phone on Friday and maybe on like a Tuesday because you just like slept over and you had like a, I don't know what, a retreat or like you turned off your phone for a few days. All of a sudden the, the price went up from like 90K to 210K. Like those jumps are possible. Um, and this will blow everyone's mind. Uh, and I just try to stay calm. <laughs> I just try to, to stay level headed, no matter what the price does and just DCA all the way, uh, and, uh, get into this Bitcoin send this Bitcoin OG send, even though I'm not an OG, but I, I see like when, whenever I have a Bitcoin OG, uh, in my podcast and, uh, they're like, since like 10 years in there, they have this really calm, like, Ah, yeah, the price will do what it do. Like they, they don't have like this. Oh, it will pump. Like, they, I try to get a, adopt that that sen of, of of theirs. If you understand what I'm meaning. Yes. No. I completely understand. Um, it's easy to kind of do again moon moon math, moon boy math. But at the same time, it's not it's not based on nothing. It's not based on nothing. That's the main thing. Absolutely. And and I think it's it's actually will happen. Uh, I think that it's just like easier. Uh, to have low expectations and get those low expectations blown out in the future uh, than the other way around. So uh, I, I think we will um, blow out every expectations and every model. As Sailor says, every model will break. Uh, maybe even his own model <laughs> that he put out. Let's see. Uh, but yeah, that. Thank you so much, uh, um, Jordi, for for being on the on the show. Uh, thank you so much for taking time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. bye.